So today we will be discussing uh, AT guidelines related, related to hyperthyroidism. So the recommendations include recommendation one, the etiology of thyrotoxicosis should be determined if the diagnosis is not apparent based on the clinical presentations and initial biochemical evaluation, diagnostic testing is indicated and can include, depending on the available expertise and resources, uh, the measurement of the trap antibodies, determination of the radioactive iodine uptake, and the measurement of the thyroidal blood flow on the ultrasonography. A thyroid scan can, should also be obtained when the clinical presentation suggests toxic adenoma or toxic multinodular goiter. This table shows the causes of the thyrotoxicosis. Thyrotoxicosis is associated with a normal or elevated radioactive iodine uptake over the neck and the causes are Graves' disease, toxic adenoma or toxic multinodular goiter, trophoblastic disease, TSH producing pituitary adenomas and resistance to thyroid hormone. The other causes include thyrotoxicosis associated with a near absent radioactive iodine uptake over the neck. And the uh, list includes uh, painless thyro thyroiditis, amitron induced thyroiditis, subacute thyroiditis, palpation thyroiditis, iatrogenic thyrotoxicosis, factitious ingestion of thyroid hormone, stroma over eye, acute thyroiditis, and extensive metastasis from the follicular thyroid cancer. Beta blockers, uh, beta blocket is in, recommended in all patients with symptomatic thyrotoxicosis, especially elderly patients and thyrotoxic patients with the, with the resting heart rates in excess of the 19 beats 90 beats per minute are the coexistent cardiovascular disease. Patients with overdecreased hyperthyroidism should be treated with any of the following modalities, which include radioactive iodine therapy, antithyroid medications, or surgery. So beta blockers in the treatment of thyrotoxicosis, uh, the commonly used medications include propanolol, and the doses, dosage range uh, ranges between 10 to 40 milligram and the frequency is three to four times per day and the considerations should be it's a non-selective beta blockers it is a longest experience and it helps in the blockage of d4 to d3 conversion at the higher doses and it's the preferred agent for nursing and pregnant mothers the other agent include etinolol and the dose, uh, the dose range include between 25 to 100 mg. It is given one to two times per day. It has got a relative, relative um, beta one selectivity. Uh, there's increased compliance and it should be uh, avoided during the pregnancy. Metaprolol, uh, the dosage uh, includes uh, ranges between 25 to 50 mg. It is given two to three times per day and has got a relative beta-1 selectivity. Nadolol, 40 to 160 mg, it is given one, uh, one steady and it's a non-selective beta blocker and it is given one steady. Uh, it has got the least experience to date and may help in the blockage of T4 to T3 conversion at the higher doses. Esmalol is the medication which can be given through the IV channel uh, at, the, at the rate of 50 to 100 microgram per kg per minute. It is used in the in intensive care unit setting of the severe thyrotoxicosis or storm. So clinical situations that favor a particular modality as a treatment for the grave hyperthyroidism. So if the patient is pregnant, then antithyroid medications are the preferred agent and in a patients with comorbidities with increased surgical risk and limited life expectancy, then radioactive iodine should be considered as the first line treatment modality. In patients with the graves, uh, with the graves of, thermo of thermopathy, which is inactive, uh, all the uh, modalities can have the equal uh, treatment efficacy and can be used um, without any uh, differences. However, in patients with the active graves of thermopathy, antithyroid medications and surgery are more effective 
uh, than the case in than the patients with inactive Graves or thermopathy. In patients with Graves, uh, in the patients with liver disease, uh, radioactive iodine is the preferred choice. And in these patients, antithyroid medications should be avoided. And in patients with previously operated or externally irradiated uh, necks, then radioactive iodine is the preferred choice. Lack of access to the high volume surgeon, again, uh, radioactive iodine is the preferred choice in these patients. And in patients with a high likelihood of remission, so these are the patients uh, which are which are typically uh, women with mild disease, with small goiters and negative or low dietary trap antibodies. So in these patients, antithyroid medications should be used with the hope that uh, remission would achieve with these medications. In patients with periodic paralysis, again, radioactive iodine is the preferred uh, choice and surgery can uh, surgery can also be uh, be chosen in these patients. Patients with right pulmonary hypertension, a congestive heart failure, radioactive iodine is the preferred choice. And in patients with comorbid uh, elderly patients with comorbidities, again antithyroid medications or radioactive iodine can be used uh, with equal uh, efficacy. And uh, in patients with coexistent primary hyperparathyroidism requiring surgery, uh, these are the patients who would uh, would would require surgery, and it should be uh, used as the first treatment modality. So overall, if we see uh, radioactive radioactive iodine is preferred in patients with a lot of comorbidities, with increased surgical risk. In patients with major adverse reactions to antithyroid medications, patients with a his previously operated or extended irradiated necks, and if there is a lack of uh, high volume thyroid surgeon, and in those patients with a history of right pulmonary hypertension or congestive heart failure, and with uh, those patients with periodic paralysis, these are the typical patients in which radioactive iodine should be given as the first treatment uh, modality. Likewise, antithyroid medications uh, is used as the first line therapy in patients with uh, in, in uh, patients with pregnancy, those with active graves of thermopathy, and those patients with a very high likelihood of remission, as we discussed with these are typically women with mild disease, small goiter, and the very low level of trap antibodies. Surgery is the um, modality which is uh, used as the first treatment modality if the patient has the active graves of thermopathy and in those patients with concomitant uh, primary hyperparathyroidism or those patients uh, who have one or more large thyroid nodules. So in different situations uh, we prefer to use different treatment modality. So radioactive iodine therapy uh, is usually considered in patients choosing radioactive iodine as the treatment for the Graves, of, uh, Graves disease would likely place relatively higher value on the definitive control of the hyperthyroidism, the avoidance of surgery, and potential side effects of antithyroid, um, antithyroid medications, as well as relatively lower value on the need for the lifelong thyroid hormone replacement, rapid resolution of hyperthyroidism, and potential worsening or the development of graves of thermopathy. Likewise, uh, while considering the antithyroid medications, there are a few points that should be kept in mind, which include that patients choosing antithyroid as the treatment for graves disease would place a relatively higher value on the possible possibility of remission and the avoidance of lifelong thyroid hormone replacement, the avoidance of surgery, and the exposure to radioactivity, radioactivity and relatively lower value on the avoidance of antithyroid side effects and the possibility of disease recurrence. Surgery uh, is, uh, is another option and it is generally considered uh, when the patient is choosing surgery as the treatment of Graves disease would likely place a relative to higher value on the prompt and relative, when, uh, definite control of the hyperthyroidism 
avoidance of exposure to radioactivity, uh, radioactivity, and these potential side effects of antithyroid medications, and a relatively lower value on the potential surgical risk and the need for the lifelong thyroid hormone replacement. So, because radioactive iodine treatment and uh, Graves' disease can cause a transient exacerbation of the hyperthyroidism, beta blockade should be considered even in asymptomatic patients who are at an increased risk for complications due to worsening of the hyperthyroidism. So these are the patients like who are elderly and patients with comorbidities. These are the common patients in which uh, uh, we should uh, use the beta blockers before giving uh, radioactive, iodine, radioactive iodine treatment. In addition to um, beta blockade, pre-treatment with uh, methimazole prior to radioactive iodine therapy for Graves disease should be considered in patients who are at an increased risk for complications due to worsening of the hyperthyroidism. And methimazole should be discontinued at least for two to three days prior to the radioactive iodine um, therapy. In patients who are at an increased risk for complications due to the worsening of the hyperthyroidism, resuming methimazole three to seven days after the uh, iodine administration should be considered, and medical therapy of any comorbid condi uh, condition should be optimized prior to iodine therapy. Sufficient activity of iodine should be considered in a single application, typically in a mean dose of 10 to 15 MCI to render the patient with Graves disease hypothyroidism. A pregnancy test should be obtained within 48 hours prior to treatment in any women with childbearing potential who is to be treated with iodine therapy. The treating physician should obtain this test and verify a negative result prior to administering the uh, iodine treatment. The physician administering uh, iodine therapy should provide a written advice concerning the radiation safety precautions following treatment. If the precautions cannot be followed, alternative therapy should be selected. Follow-up within the first one to two months after the iodine therapy for the Graves disease should include an assessment of free T4, total T3, and TSH. Biochemical monitoring should be continued at four to six week intervals for the first six months or until the patient becomes hypothyroid and is stable on the thyroid hormone replacement. When hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease persists after six months following the iodine therapy, retreatment with iodine therapy is uh, recommended or suggested. In selected patients with minimal response, three months after the therapy, additional iodine may be considered. Methimazole should be used in virtually every patient who chooses antithyroid medication for the Graves' disease, except during the first trimester of pregnancy when propyl thyrosyl is preferred in the treatment of thyroid storm and in patients with min minor patients uh, to methimazole who refuses radioactive iodine therapy or surgery. Patients should be informed of the side effects of antithyroid drugs and the necessity of informing the physician promptly if they should develop a pruritic rash, jaundice, A colic stools, or the dark urine, arthralgias, abdominal pain, nausea, fatigue, fever, or pharyngitis. Preferably, this information should be in uh, should be in writing. And before starting antithyroid drugs, and at each subsequent visit, the patient should be alerted to stop the medication immediately and call their physician if there are symptoms suggestive of agranulocytosis or hepatic toxicity. Prior to initiating antithyroid therapy for Graves disease, it is suggested that patients have a baseline complete CBC with differential and the liver uh, profile, including bilirubin and transaminases. 
A differential WBC count should be obtained during a febrile illness and at the onset of pharyngitis in all patients taking antithyroid medication. There is insufficient evidence to recommend for or against routine monitoring of uh, WBC count in uh, patients taking the antithyroid drugs. Liver function and hepatocellular injury integrity should be assessed in patients taking MMI or propyl thyrosyl or exper experience periodic rash, jaundice, uh, light colored stool or dark urine, joint pain, abdominal pain or clotting, anorexia, nausea and fatigue. There is insufficient information uh, to recommend for or against routine monitoring for the liver function test in patients taking the antithyroid drugs. No recommendation uh, in the vision advance to, uh, uh, to assess the benefits and risk. Minor cutaneous reactions may be managed with uh, concurrent antihistamine therapy without uh, stopping the antithyroid drugs. Persistent symptomatic minor side effects of antithyroid medication should be managed by uh, the uh, stop, stopping of the medication and um, changing of changing to radioactive iodine or surgery or switching to the other antithyroid drug when radioactive iodine or surgery are not the options. In case of serious allergic reaction, prescribing the alternative to, alternative drug is not recommended. Measurement of trap levels prior to stopping the antithyroid drug is suggested because it aids in predicting which patient can be weaned from the medication with normal levels indicating greater chance for remission. If uh, methimazole is chosen as the primary therapy for Graves disease, the medication should be continued for approximately 12 to 18 months, then discontinued if the TSH and trap levels are normal at that time. If a patient with Graves disease becomes hyperthyroid after completing a course of methimazole, consideration should be given to treatment with uh, iodine therapy or thyroidectomy, continued low dose methimazole treatment for longer than 12 to 18 months may be considered in patients not in remission who prefer this approach. If surgery is chosen as the treatment for the Graves disease, patients should be rendered euthyroid prior to the procedure with antithyroid pretreatment with or without beta blockade. Potassium iodide containing preparation should be given in the immediate preoperative period. Calcium and 25 hydroxy vitamin D should be assessed preoperatively and depleted if necessary are given prophylactically. Calcitriol supplementation should be considered preoperatively in patients at an increased risk for transient or permanent hypoparathyroidism. In exceptional circumstances, when it is not possible to render a patient with Graves disease euthyroid prior to the surgery, the need for the thyroidectomy is urgent, or when the patient is allergic to uh, antithyroid medic uh, drugs, the patient should be adequately treated with beta blocker, potassium iodide, steroids, and potentially cholestyramine in the immediate preoperative period. The surgeon and an anesthesiologist should have experienced in this situation. If surgery is uh, chosen as the primary therapy for the Graves disease, near total or total thyroidectomy is the procedure of choice. If surgery is chosen as the primary therapy for the Graves disease, the patient should be referred to a high volume thyroid surgeon. Uh, following surgery, alternative strategies may be undertaken for the management of calcium levels. Serum calcium with or without intact PTH levels can be measured and oral calcium and calcitriol supplementation administered based on these results are prophylactic calcium with or without calcitriol prescribed empirically. 
Antithyroid drugs should be stopped at the time of thyroidectomy for the Graves disease and beta blockers should be weaned following the surgery. Uh, post surgery, uh, thyroxine should be started at a low dose appropriate for the patient weight. Uh, that is 1.6 um, uh, microgram per kg with, uh, with elderly patients needing somewhat less and serum TSH measured six to eight weeks post-operatively. Communication among different members of the multidisciplinary team is essential, particularly during transitions of care in the pre and the post-operative settings. If a thyroid nodule is discovered in patient with Graves disease, the nodule should be evaluated and managed according to the recently published guidelines uh, regarding thyroid nodules in euthyroid individuals. The diagnosis of thyroid storm should be made clinically in a severely thyrotoxic patients with the evidence of systemic decompensation. Adjunctive use of sensitive diagnostic system should be considered. A patient with a Birch Watowski point scale or the Japanese Thyroid Association categories. Japanese Thyroid Association categorized of the thyroid storm one are the thyroid storm two with evidence of systemic decompensation requires aggressive therapy. The decision to use aggressive therapy in patients with a, um, with a score of 25 to 44 should be based on the clinical judgment. A multidisciplinary treatment approach to patients with a thyroid storm should be used, including beta blocker, antithyroid therapy, inorganic iodide, corticosteroid therapy, cooling with acetaminophen and cooling blankets, volume resuscitation, nutritional support, and respiratory care, and monitoring in the intensive care unit as appropriate for the individual patient. So the point scale for the diagnosis of thyroid storm. So uh, these are the different points that uh, the thermo regulatory dysfunction and uh, different points are given, uh, different categories are given, different points, which, in, uh, which in, we can see that the temperature, if the temperature is uh, between 90, 99 to 99.9, .9, the patient is given five points. And if it is, if it is between 100 to 109, patients given 10 points between 101 and 101.9, uh, is given 15 points. Likewise, in patients with a temperature of greater than 104, the point is uh, the 30 points is given to these patients. Likewise, uh, with with, res with regards to cardiovascular system, uh, if the patient has got tachycardia, uh, ranging between 100 to 109, uh, patient is given five points. And if the heart rate is greater than 140, these patients are given 25 point, points. So, so these points are in the multiples or multiples of uh, five. Likewise, if uh, if there is atrial fibrillation, these patients are given 10 points, uh, while the absence is uh, absent uh, atrial fibrillation is given zero. With the congestive heart failure, uh, it is categorized into mild, moderate, and severe. The severe one is given 20 points, while the mild one is given five points. With regards to gastrointestinal hepatic dysfunction, if there is severe joint disease, these patients are given 20 points, while in case if there is, uh, if there is a moderate manifestation, that includes diarrhea, abdominal pain, nausea, and vomiting, a 10 point is given to uh, this category. With regards to central nervous system, if there is uh, severe involvement uh, with seizure and coma, 30 point is given uh, in those patients. While if there is mild agitation, then 10 point is given to these patients. If there is uh, any history uh, which, is, uh, uh, which is negative, then uh, it is given like any precipitant history, like this could be confused with a lot of other medical conditions like uh, septic shock, 
any fever, any, um, any inflammatory conditions. So if there is any such uh, condition, then uh, the, uh, if then the points given are zero, and if the history is negative, then 10 points is given to, uh, to the overall uh, categories. So the score is total, uh, overall it is calculated. And if the score is greater than 45, then uh, the thyroid storm is very likely. And if the score is less than 25, the storm is uh, unlikely. And those uh, with a score between 25 to 45, uh, these patients are categorized as the impending storm. So thyroid storm drugs and doses. Uh, different medications are given, including the propyl thyrosyl, and the propyl thyrosyl is given in the dosage of 500 to 1000 milligram as the loading dose, then 250 mg every four hourly. And the, uh, it, it helps in the blockade of new hormone synthesis. Also, it blocks T4 to T3 conversion. Um, likewise, methimazole is given. Uh, methimazole can be used in these patients um, with a, in a high dose that is 60 to 80 mg per day and in, helps in the blockade of new hormone synthesis. Propyl thyrosyl, it is given in a very in high doses, uh, usually between 60 to 80 mg every four hours. And it is considered invasive and invasive monitoring in congestive heart failure patient is recommended. It helps in the blockade of T4 to T3 conversion in high doses and alternative drug is asmalol infusion. Iodine, that is saturated solution of potassium iodide. Five drops are given, uh, that is 0.25 ml or 250 mg orally every six hourly. Do not start until one hour after the antithyroid drugs. And uh, these drugs help in the blockade of new hormone synthesis, blocks thyroid hormone release, and the alternative drug includes glucose solution. Steroids are also given, uh, that is hydrocortisone, in the dosage of 300 mg IV load, then every then 100 mg every Q8 hourly. It also helps in the uh, blockade of T4 to T3 conversion and prophylaxis against the relative adrenal insufficiency. And the alternative med uh, drug in this case includes uh, dexamethasone. Potassium iodide may be of benefit in selected patients with hyperthyroidism due to Graves' disease, those who have adverse reactions to antithyroid drugs, and those who have a contraindication or aversion to a radioactive iodine therapy or surgery. Treatment may be more suitable for patients with mild hyperthyroidism or a prior history of iodine therapy. And it is suggested that patients with overtly toxic martinal goiter or toxic adenoma be treated with uh, iodine therapy or the thyroidectomy. On occasions, long-term low-dose treatment with methimazole may be appropriate. So, uh, as we discussed, uh, clinical situations that favor a particular modality is the treatment for the toxic multilayer goiter or the toxic adenoma. In case of pregnancy, antithyroid medications are preferred, while patients with advanced age comorbidities with increased surgical risk or limited life expectancy, then iodine therapy should be considered as the first treatment uh, First treatment option. Patients with previously operated or externally radiated necks, then iodine is the preferred choice. And uh, if there is coexistent hyperparathyroidism requiring surgery, then surgery is the uh, first line treatment modality. Because iodine therapy uh, treatment of the toxic multinodal goiter or toxic adenoma can cause a transient exacerbation of hyperthyroidism beta blockade should be considered even in asymptomatic patients who are at increased risk for complications due to worsening of hyperthyroidism. In addition to beta blockade, 
pre-treatment with methimazole prior to radioactive iodine treat therapy for toxic maternal requiter or toxic adenoma should be considered in patients who are at increased risk for the complications due to worsening of hyperthyroidism, including the elderly and those with cardiovascular disease or severe hyperthyroidism. In patients who are at incre increased risk for complications due to worsening of hyperthyroidism, resuming antithyroid drugs three to seven days after the radioactive iodine administration should be considered. Non-functioning nodules on the uh, thyroid scan or nodules with suspicious ultrasound characteristics should be managed according to published guidelines regarding thyroid nodules in euthyroid individuals. Sufficient activity of uh, iodine therapy should be administered in a single application to improve the hyperthyroidism in patients with toxic multinodular goiter. Sufficient activity of iodine therapy should be administered in a single application to improve hyperthyroidism in patients with toxic adenoma follow up within the first one to two months after iodine therapy for the toxic multinodal goiter or the toxic adenoma should include an assessment of the free T4, total T3 and TSH. Biochemical monitoring should be continued at four to six week intervals for the six months or until the patient becomes hypothyroid and is stable on the thyroid hormone replacement. If hyperthyroidism persists beyond six months following iodine therapy for the uh, multinodular goiter or the toxic adenoma, the retreatment with iodine therapy is recommended. In selected patients with minimal response three months after the therapy, additional radioactive iodine may be considered. If surgery is chosen as the treatment for toxic multinucleotide or the toxic adenoma, patients with overt hyperthyroidism should be rendered euthyroid prior to the procedure with methimazole pretreatment with or without beta blocker. If surgery is chosen as the treatment for toxic multinucleotide, near total or total thyroidectomy should be performed. Surgery for the toxic multinodicoiter should be performed by a high volume thyroid surgeon. If surgery is chosen as the treatment for the toxic adenoma, a thyroid ultrasound should be done to evaluate the entire thyroid gland. An epsidatory thyroid lobectomy or stemectomy, if the adenoma is in the thyroid stemus, should be performed for isolated toxic adenomas. Following thyroidectomy for toxic maternal goiter, serum calcium with or without intact pH levels should be measured or the oral calcium and calcitriol supplementation administered based on the results. Methimazole should be stopped at the time of surgery for the toxic maternal goiter or the toxic adenoma. Beta blockers should be slowly discontinued following the surgery. Following thyroidectomy for the toxic multinodal goiter, thyroid hormone replacement should be started at a dose appropriate for the patient's weight and age with elderly patients needing somewhat less dosage. TSH should be measured every one to two months until it, it, is, it stabilizes and then annually. Following lobectomy for the toxic adenoma, TSH and estimated free T4 levels should be obtained four to six weeks after the surgery and thyroid hormone supplementation started if there is a persistent rise in TSH above the reference range. Iodine therapy should be uh, used for the re retreatment of, uh, for the retreatment of persistent or the recurrent hyperthyroidism following inadequate surgery for toxic goiter or the toxic adenoma. Long-term Methimazole treatment for the toxic multinodal goiter or toxic adenoma might be indicated in some elderly or otherwise ill patients with limited life expectancy in patients who are not good candidates for the surgery or ablative therapy 
and in patients who prefer this option. And alternative therapies, uh, alternative therapies such as ethanol or uh, RFA of the toxic adenoma and toxic multinodal goiter can be considered in selected patients in bone uh, radioactive iodine uh, surgery are the long-term antithyroid drugs are inappropriate, contraindicated, or refused. And expertise in this procedure is available. Children with Graves' disease should be treated with methimazole, radioactive iodine therapy, or thyroidectomy. Radioactive iodine therapy should be avoided in very young, young children who are less than five years of age. Radioactive iodine therapy in children is acceptable if the activity is greater than 150 ICI per gram of thyroid tissue. And for the children between five to five and 10 years of age, if the calculated radioactive iodine administration activity is less than 10 MCI. Thyroidectomy should be chosen when definitive therapy is required. The child is too young for the radioactive iodine and surgery can be performed by a high volume thyroid surgeon. Methimazole should be used in children who are treated with antithyroid therapy. Pediatric patients and the caretakers should be informed of the side effects of antithyroid, preferably in writing, and the necessity of stopping the medication immediately and informing their physician if they develop periodic rash, joint days, a colic stools, arthritis, arthralgias, abdominal pain, nausea, fatigue, fever, or pharyngitis. Prior to initiating antithyroid therapy, it is suggested that pediatric patients have a baseline complete blood count, including the BBC count with differential and the liver profile, including the bilirubin, transaminases, and alkaline phosphatase. Beta blockade is recommended for the children experiencing symptoms of hyperthyroidism, especially those with the heart rates in excess of 100 beats per minute. Antithyroid drugs should be stopped immediately and WBC counts measured in children who develops, develop fever, arthralgia, mouth sores, pharyngitis, or malaise. In general, propyl PTU should not be used in children but if it is used, the medication should be stopped immediately and liver function and hepatocellular integrity assessed in children who experience anorexia, pruritus, rash, jaundice, lycal stool, or dark urine, joint pain, right upper quadrant pain, or abdominal bloating, nausea, or malaise. Persistent or minor cutaneous reactions to methimazole and children should be managed with concurrent antihistamine treatment, association of the medication, and changing to therapy with radioactive iodine or the surgery. In the case of a serious adverse reaction to an antithyroid drug, prescribing the other antithyroid drug is not recommended. If methimazole is chosen as the first line treatment for the Graves disease in children, it may be tapered in those children requiring lower doses after one to two years to determine if a spontaneous remission has occurred or it may be continued until the child and caretakers, caretakers are ready. If children are tolerating antithyroid therapy, antithyroid drugs may be used for the extended periods. This approach may be especially useful for the child not considered to be candidate for either surgery or radioactive iodine therapy. Individuals on the prolonged antithyroid therapy, that is greater than two years, should be re-evaluated every six to 12 months and when transi uh, transitioning to adulthood. It is suggested that children with Graves' disease having total T4 of greater than uh, 20 uh, nanogram per deciliter are the free T4 greater than 5 uh, sh uh, who are to receive the radioactive iodine therapy be pre-treated with methimazole or beta blocker until the total T4 and the free T4 normalizes before proceeding with radioactive iodine treatment. 
If radioactive iodine therapy is chosen as the treatment for the Graves disease in children, sufficient radioactive iodine should be administered in single dose to render the patient hypothyroid. Children with Graves disease undergoing thyroidectomy should be rendered euthyroid with the use of methimazole, a potassium containing potassium iodide containing preparation should be given in the immediate preoperative period. If surgery is chosen uh, as therapy for the Graves disease in children, total or near total thyroidectomy should be performed. When TSH is persistently below the lower limit of normal, treatment of TSH should be considered in individuals greater than 50 year, uh, 65 years of age and in patients with cardiac disease, osteoporosis, or the symptoms of hyperthyroidism. When TSH is persistently below the lower limit of normal, say asymptomatic patients under the age of 65 without cardiac disease or osteoporosis can be observed without further investigation of the etiology of the subnormal TSH or treatment. If TSH is, if subclinical hyperthyroidism is to be treated, the treatment should be based on the etiology of the thyroid dysfunction and follow the same principles as outlined for the treatment of overt hyperthyroidism. So subclinical hyperthyroidism, when to treat? If the patient is greater than 65 years of age and TSH is less than 0.1 micro unit per liter, then these patients should be treated. So any patient greater than 65 years uh, and the TSH is uh, low, then these patients should be uh, treated. However, uh, if the patient is less than 65, year of, uh, 65 years of age with comorbidities, which include heart disease, osteoporosis, menopausal, not on estrogen, menopausal women who are not on estrogens are dysphosphonate and hyperthyroid symptoms, so these are the patients who uh, should be treated um, for this subclinical hyperthyroidism. And in patients who are less than 65 years of age um, and who are asymptomatic, then, and the TSH is also low, then uh, the uh, treatment should be considered or um, these patients can be closely observed. Thank you.